Hello, my name is David Bruce. So in this video, I'm going to look at some pieces, some compositions that were submitted by viewers. Most of the ones I'll include here were submitted by patrons over at Patreon. And do feel free to check out my Patreon page if you're interested in getting a critique. You're also welcome to send through examples to davidbrucecomposer at gmail.com. Although I would warn you that I've had quite a few submissions, even though I only did one of these videos a long time ago. And I'll probably only be able to spend time on something that if I feel I've got something to say that's of interest to a wider audience here on YouTube. But if you feel like you'd like to take the chance, do feel free and thanks for your understanding if I don't get a chance to reply. So the first piece we'll look at is by Patreon supporter Caleb Crouch, who is a euphonium player who writes pieces for himself to play on the solo euphonium with a loop pedal. I asked Caleb to point out to me any areas he was unhappy with in the piece or any areas he thought he'd like advice on. Here's what he said. I really enjoy playing it and there are a lot of aspects I like about it. However, I'm really struggling with whether or not it would be thought of as well put together. I'm worried about this because I want to gig more often. My goal is to create a set list of cover tunes and my own compositions so I can have the ability to play at bars, performances, venues and outdoor concerts. However, I also want to try to appeal to people who have studied music in a formal setting like myself. Even though I enjoy playing and I'm proud of what I've written, I'm still struggling with whether my music can be considered smart enough for other musicians like myself. Caleb also asked about the best way to notate what he'd written. He has a series of nine foot pedals and he sent through a full score showing the start of each new repeated phrase, as well as an individual part just written out on one line. So firstly, I can relate very strongly to what you say regarding the twin audiences of, as it were, the popular and the academic. You'd like the piece to work in a public setting for an audience to enjoy it, but you'd also like it to be thought of well by your respected peers. So we have to pull apart these slightly conflicting reasons for your writing music. If your first goal is to have some enjoyable and entertaining pieces that you can perform solo in a bar or wherever, well that's one thing and there are of course all sorts of things you might do to attempt to make it more popular. But if you have an artistic vision for the kind of piece you want to write, which is the kind of writing I always aim for, then your goal really should be to block out thoughts of either of those two audiences, and especially the academic one. The fact is, attempting to appeal to an audience rarely works. Believe it or not, I've tried this on my channel. If you look through my videos, you'll see that about the fourth or the fifth one I did was on Ed Sheeran. At the time, I felt sure this would be my biggest video hit to date, as Sheeran's so popular. But actually, I think it's been my worst performing of all my videos. So since then, I've fully embraced what I always intended should be the case, that my only criteria for doing a new video was that it was something I was interested and excited by. And on the whole, the more nerdy I get, as I've said before, the, the better they seem to do. It's very hard to predict what will find a home in the audience. For example, on your piece, you might try making your loops more popular by adding tr more traditional beat type of backings. But then one of the instantly unique and appealing things about what you've done, a piece for the mellow and quite chilled sound of multiple euphoniums, would be lost. If anything, I would recommend you continue to refine and amplify the distinguishing qualities of your setup. And I actually think mellowness is quite a key ingredient. I could imagine really pushing that soft and gentle aspect of the piece a lot further. Either way though, considering whether your music is smart enough is definitely something you shouldn't waste your time worrying about. There are some highly considered composers out there who write incredibly simple styles. Howard Skempton in the UK is one example. Finding a vision you yourself believe in and developing it confidently, irrespective of what your peers think, is the most important thing, I would say. That said, I've often thought about the loop pedal concept in general. It seems like a very specific limiting of compositional possibilities. I touched on this in my choral video recently, and as many of you will know, Nare Sol recently did a great vid video all about looping. And there's another great one by Tantacruel, which I mentioned on Twitter the other day. And the key thing with it seems to be to find a way to subvert our expectations, as it can become too easy to imagine what's going to come next, and we therefore switch off. In your case, making more and quicker changes might be one option. I really like the moment at bar 37 in your piece, both for the fact that the texture changed, but also the texture itself there I thought was a great oral picture.
You asked about the notation, and personally I would love to have both a score which would show all the repeating parts, so we could easily see what was supposed to be sounding at any one moment. So not just the start of the loop as you have it, but the loop itself written out. But then in the individual part, what I would do is put a text box before the score explaining numbers 1 to 8, which effect you have assigned to which pedal. And then in the score above the appropriate bar, add the number in a circle, perhaps with some way of indicating that it's turning on or off as a reminder. If the performer also had the score, they could then compare what they're doing to what's written to make sure they're doing the right thing. It might be worth checking out harp notation or accordion or organ notation, both of which might give you some pointers in the right direction. Next up is American Foundry by Joshua Haugen. <laughs> So I enjoyed the tone and the gritty harmony of this piece, which I thought worked really well on the saxophones. I thought it was particularly effective when a small motive was passed around the ensemble. Generally, I thought the notation needed a lot more dynamics and particularly slurs. If you take the opening note, is it piano crescendoing to fortissimo? Or is it forte crescending to fortissimo? Or is it an accented note with a crescendo, which would have a slight reduction in volume after the initial tack before the crescendo? A sort of slingshot effect, which would sound quite effective, I think, here. Or is it supposed to emerge from the silence, which might be quite tricky at that register on the baritone sax? All of these options would create a very different effect, but I suspect you only have one in particular in mind, so you should do your best to describe it in notation as best as possible. Some articulations will help emphasise the musical points you're making. For example, in bar 39, I imagine putting a crescendo in each part will help emphasise the effect you're after, which is a sort of burst of activity which is then cut off. I like the section up to bar 55 where the music starts to break out of its initial harmonic background. It feels very exciting. If I'm honest, I would have liked it to have gone somewhere other than the somewhat less interesting slow section. Arriving at slow sections without it feeling like a sort of let down or anti-climax is a big concern of mine generally. And you need to make sure that you're as passionate about the music you write in those moments as elsewhere. Bear in mind that you can have slow but loud and intense music as well as fast but quiet and relaxed. Both will offer you a change of texture but might give you more things to play with musically. Here's an example from Earth Dances by my old teacher Harrison Bertwistle. And something tells me you'll quite like his music, so do check it out if you haven't already heard it. You can see that the slow section is laced with this huge tension, so the sense of momentum keeps going even though it's a slow section. So I originally made this critique to Joshua several months ago, and he's since completely re revised the piece. And he's put it up on YouTube, I'll link to it below. And I think he's really particularly taken that last point to heart. You can see uh, there's a slow section at the end which maintains a real sense of tension driving through to the very end of the piece. Next up is a piece called Suite for Clarinet, Violin, Cello and Marimba by Lucas Orizonte. This piece for the most part has an E-flat drone with melodic lines above. In my Composing Hacks video, I mentioned the idea of listening to the various combinations that might be available to you from within the ensemble. To me, this movement feels like you had a musical idea before you had the ensemble. In the opening, for example, it feels like, along with the melodic lines, you had the idea for a birdsong-like interaction with the high staccato notes and trills, a bit like the opening of Mahler's First Symphony.
but to me this feels something that's a bit forced onto the ensemble rather than an idea that emerged from the combination. I can imagine this idea working really well on a much larger orchestral palette, but in this piece you don't have the full orchestra so you should try and make sure that you use ideas that really match the combination. By far my favourite section of this movement is from bar 54 onwards, the faster music. Here the combination feels much better used. One thing that occurred to me is that perhaps you could write the same piece again without using the drone at all, or just perhaps hinting at it. This would allow us to feel it there without you having to play it the whole time. This would certainly free up the instruments and allow, for example, much more interaction between the violin and cello, which is one of those combinations that speaks to me from this lineup. I didn't have as much time to look at the second part. I can see that the ideas here feel much more rooted in the combination, which is great. What I would say is to think about more non-traditional options for how you use the instruments. For example, on the whole, I think you mostly have the cello playing a bass line, the marimba playing chords and arpeggios, the violin and the clarinet playing solo lines. So I think the music could benefit a lot from shaking up some of these certainties. For example, having the clarinet playing an accompanying figure, having the marimba playing a more prominent or extended solo line, or having the violin doing a bass line. And don't forget, as I suggested about the drone, sometimes you can imply rather than filling in all the detail. So you could imply a larger chord by having the clarinet just pick out a couple of notes from it. Sometimes after you've had an idea, try making some holes in it and you might actually find it improves it rather than detracts from it. It's sometimes good to make the audience fill in the gaps and do some listening for themselves. And without wanting to plug my own music too much, I did ask Lucas to listen to my piece The Constellation of Rain, which is for a similar combination, a harp, marimba, oboe and cello, which I think has some examples of how I vary the uses of the instruments. So in the opening, for example, the cello almost always plays a two-note tremolo chord. But there are also examples of very low solo lines. very high ones, as well as a range of different rhythmic accompaniments. And in another movement I have a dialogue between the oboe and the higher register of the harp to give you an example of an unexpected use of instruments. Finally let's look at East Texas Landscapes by Victor Eichhout. Now I was so delighted with these pieces to the extent that I'm not sure there's any advice I can give to improve them. I've listened through to them several times and they've only grown on me and I hope for everyone else watching there'll be a sense of how to do things right from these pieces. They're in a style that I can personally very much relate to. They have, they're kind of miniature movements that each do one thing. And they're often quite witty and the harmony is rooted in tonality but moves in such an interesting way throughout. What I think works particularly well is the balance between repetition and surprise. It's all too common for a piece that starts as simply as say this Hearn crossing movement to just sort of noodle on and go nowhere, the initial charm of the opening soon wearing off. But here there's an introduction of chromaticism at just the right point, which leads to a full-blown texture change at bar 43 before a brief witty reprise. It's a perfect sort of short story of a piece. It reminds me a little bit of Ligeti's Six Bagatelles for Wind Quintet in the way that they start with a very accessible and fun idea and then twist it into a surprising and interesting journey. The harmony, whilst it often appears very simple, moves with great subtlety. Several times, for example, you find this sort of slip-sliding harmony. 
and cadences that land in surprising places and at surprising moments. Finally, in the Crockett Mansion piece, I love how we don't feel the beat until we're some way in, so it's a quite a surprise when it emerges. These are subtle little tricks which show me that you really know what you're doing and how the listener's going to perceive things. That might not be the most entirely helpful critique, apart from, as in hopefully an ego boost, but it's truly a pleasure to see a piece where everything is just so tightly organized and just works beautifully to create the finished product. So I hope that was useful and interesting for you all. Please post me your comments below what you thought. Would you like to see more of these kind of videos? Do like and subscribe and share with your friends. And if you really enjoyed the channel or if you'd like to have your own work critiqued, then do head on over to Patreon and join my wonderful supporters over there. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.